Hi, I still don't have my studio set up. I recently moved, and besides breaking the bank, the other thing I managed to do was to break a lot of my sculptures. So today I'm going to show you what I did about that. Welcome to Breath of Life. Destruction. We've changed our names. Breath of Life Destruction is the new name of the studio, and uh, destruction is what this episode is all about. So, I think a big part of what I hope to show you is not just like how to fix things, but what you're going to learn is how to make things so that they don't need to be fixed as much in the future, um, because I'm restoring a lot of sculptures that I did 15 plus years ago before I knew as much as I know now about how to make robust and uh, strong stuff. So yeah, I, I think I think this will be educational from both ends. How to make stuff that breaks less and then how to fix the stuff that does break. So let's dive right into uh, several of these sculptures that I managed to needlessly destroy during this move. We're gonna start out with this monkey boy, one of my costume kids. Uh, this guy's been around for a while. Now you can see the tail's broken here, and the, you know, it, it, it's probably best to just take off your spike gauntlet. You know, you do want to be safe in case of ninja attack, but sometimes it's just more efficient to do art without your defenses. So yeah, the tail, I turns out I could just literally pull the thing right off, um, and there's like a a clump that used to be there that's not there anymore so I was trying to decide can I just shove it further in there and then uh, not have to rebuild the base of it but it turns out that the back of the tail would like not work that way I could bend it a little bit but it's still it's, it's still a little iffy there anyway uh, first things first we got to get rid of uh, over a decade of dust and <laughs> so uh, always wear a dust mask uh, yeah, often uh, blowing with a canned air doesn't do the trick because the dust is like, I don't know, it's baked in. Yeah, you can see this was from 2006, back in the day. So there are a lot of best practices I did not know about back then. This was before I was really online and plugged into communities that could teach me <laughs> things I needed to know about this sort of thing which is why it's great that they exist now. Plug for my Discord, please check it out. We share all sorts of cool tips there. So yeah, spent a while just uh, dusting and stuff. Here's like the biggest crack right there. I tried to super glue it and that didn't quite do the trick. This is just something that happens with old polymer clay, specifically Sculpey. You can see it happened on my oot here. And then another issue I'm seeing is this white residue, which I thought was maybe rubbed off from something else, but it's actually in the divots, so that's kind of weird. This part right here is from bumping into another sculpture, so I could just kind of scrape it off and it worked fine. But yeah, all these little, this little white residue, I had to like poke my knife into it to try to get at it. And at some point I decided it just wasn't worth it. Also, apparently I spattered brown paint around at some point. You know, these guys are hanging out in the art studio, so it's not surprising they're gonna get some splash damage. Um, I was trying to figure out what to do with the base here as well. Um, it turns out I'm just gonna end up repainting it. Now, I'm using two-part epoxy clay here and I'm tinting it with some acrylic paint. This is not the best stuff to use. It ends up making it really tacky and difficult to work with. There is a dye that works a lot better. I just couldn't find it because, as you know, I'm still in the middle of setting up my shop. Anyway, I did my best to recreate the edge of the tail and kind of blend it in. I managed to keep a library of the texture stamps that I used for the cloth, and so I have some of those, and they're designed in these funny shapes so that they can, you know, get all the little nooks and crannies of the folds and wrinkles of the clothing. But yeah, it was really nice to have those on hand. So pro tip, you know, keep those around. If you're making texture stamps, keep a box with them. And I stuck some super glue on there and 
ramming that tail right in. And by the time I kind of got everything massaged back into place, I had to go back in and retexture a bit. And using more of this epoxy clay to fill in this gap of a crack here. If I were to do this sculpture again, I would make the legs pretty much completely out of epoxy clay, especially if you have a load-bearing member like this ankle here that's holding up an awkwardly balanced large heavy statue on top. And just using some of that brown acrylic paint to blend it in. The clay that I actually used was colored, so um, the kind of nice thing about that is that if you scratch it or whatever, it's not going to have a different color underneath it. Um, the bad part apparently is that this residue occurred, and I, I still have no idea why. If anyone is an expert on polymer clay and can tell me why this uh, colored clay ended up doing this, it was probably colored Fimo, maybe churn it. Not sure, but yeah, I'd love to know if anyone has run into that before, why that happened. And yep, repainting the base, stippling the texture so the brush strokes aren't as evident. And got him to a point where I felt, okay, good enough. There's still some of that white residue in there, but it's mostly painted over. I think standing on the shelf, he looks just fine now. Now this big boy. So this is my uh, rock monster from this piece called A Picnic Interrupted. And you can see it has a portrait of my two sons back when they were smaller. I always fantasized about them having these kind of fun adventures together. Now my older son there, he's supposed to be pointing and his finger snapped off. This is probably the 10th time that's happened. And of course it landed on the floor here. I tried to search for it in vain and could not find it. So figured time to make a tougher finger. Yeah, this thing's been building up dust for quite a while. Again, dust mask. Oh look, I found a new friend. Just in time for Halloween. Speaking of little critters, uh, this is like sort of a Easter egg. If you examine the piece close enough, you can see this little bunny who's fallen out of its rabbit hole. And here you can see the eyes are set to light up with these little tea lights that I embedded in there. I set them upside down like that so that I could replace the batteries as needed, but these batteries are well over a decade old and look at that, the eyes still work. Here's how I attached a lot of the rocks. I sculpted them around needles and then stabbed them into the clay. And some of them just broke off, so that's pretty easy to fix. The armature is a pretty thick aluminum, but um, the, also the weight of the clay bends it down, so I just bent it back up, it's fine. Man, I put so much detail on here, like all the backpacks and clothes and everything, these were like accurate representations of what my sons actually had with them. And so here I'm digging into the hand a little bit. You can see this was made from Super Sculpey Firm. That's why it's gray. And I'm being very careful as I go so I don't snap the hand off. Using a little hand drill to very carefully make a hole that's hopefully just large enough for a thick piece of wire. fit. Yes, that works. I cut it a little bit shorter than it needs to be so that the clay will be at the very tip of the finger. I'm not going to end up fighting with the uh, metal and have to like clip it back after I've done sculpting. That's just a terrible experience. So I'm using more of this clay that I used on the monkey boy and uh, you know it's still sticky and not super great to work with so the takeaway from this is do not mix acrylic paint with your epoxy clay
and I'm trying to apply just a delicate touch of super glue. And then it turns out to push it back into place, I ended up destroying the sculpture anyway, so eh, just gotta kinda re sculpt it. Now, when it comes to matching the paint that's already there, I'm not super good with color, so I just I just mix a lot on there and eventually I get close enough. Now some of these other rocks broke, um, The again the armature wasn't quite thick enough to hold it up perfectly, so there were some stress points where it snapped. And then this uh, dirt part, I think it was made out of some kind of paper mache pulpy stuff, and so the parts where it got thin were breaking off, so I'm just touching it up with uh, more brown paint. As you can see, this was made in 2010. And yeah, I think, uh, I think he holds up. Pretty fun. Those crystals, by the way, were just collected from a rock shop where I got a big old bag of crystals for half price at some point. The eyes were made out of uh, resin that I poured into a mold. And now they're ready to go back on their adventure. Hooray! Look at all those fun little details. A little apple, peanut butter jelly sandwich. I like looking at this piece. Okay, next on the agenda, we've got this a little temptress here. Um, you know, this one literally was a drop onto the floor from probably six feet up. And uh, yeah was very frustrating. The wings themselves were already embedded into the, the resin body with pegs, and so I ran into this problem when I tried to reattach them by drilling holes and then re-pegging them, I was running into the pegs that were already there. Um, for the water, I just super glued it because they were perfectly flat edges anyway, but this little chunk there, I just couldn't find. So I'm gonna try to figure out a way around this. And here I'm going to be using a new material that I have literally never used before, which is UV resin. I've seen a lot of people using it, and it seems pretty cool. Um, I haven't seen people use it as a, you know, repair mechanism like I'm doing it, so we're going to see how it works now. So I'm getting rid of all the epoxy clay that I tried on my first attempt to get these together because there just wasn't enough surface to hold it together. And here's my UV resin. I'm using super glue first, but I'm not going to use that to hold it in place. And then it occurred to me, hey, I should probably test this real quick to make sure it works. I'm using a UV flashlight here, just shining it on a dot. And after about 10, 15 seconds, it's pretty much a nice, like clear piece of plastic. I'm really impressed with this stuff. Now I know that anywhere the UV light can't get into, it's not going to fully harden. So I'm just doing it around the edges and then thinking that the super glue in conjunction with the, uh, with the outside resin will do the trick. Pretty cool UV effects here. But yeah, the nice thing is that it sets so fast that you can just hold it with your hand. You don't have to set up some fancy jig to hold it in place while glue dries or something. And I'm going to see if it works on this little missing chunk here. Just put some more foil down. That's how the original was made with the foil and then just some water effects stuff over it. And after that dried, peeled the uh, foil off the back and it looks... Good enough. Officially good enough. Like, if you're not looking close at it, I don't even think you would notice that it's been shattered and put back together. And there she is, ready to lure unwary travelers into the swamp once again. Okay, next up we've got Big Roar, and he's got big cracks. Another one of my costume kids. Uh, got several cracks all around. Some hairline fractures as well. 
So first things first, I've got to really scrub this guy down. Um, the, the dust was not blowing off without <laughs> water and scrub brushes, sadly. So it took a while to do that. But again, the fact that the base color is the color of the clay makes it so I don't have to worry that I'm going to be rubbing paint off. And just more weird goop and stuff on the base I've got to try to deal with. Here is the stuff that I was missing. I found it. This is so strong color tint that's made specifically for mixing with products like epoxy clay. And it's way better to work with. So I mixed it a color that was the base, not the base color, but the shadow color so that I could just do a highlight dry brush over it when I'm done. You can see here that the bottom layer was done with some guy. I'm not even sure what kind of clay the base was. I'm, I'm sure it was polymer clay, um, but I'm not sure what kind it was. I just made the armature basically that way, like over the wire, and then put the clay for the costume on top of that. And more tail troubles. I seem to have trouble with tails. That looks really gross. Okay, this part, hopefully super glue will hold it together. We'll find out. And here we've got some male lion pattern balding going on. All of these hairs were individually hand-pressed in. I poked holes in the clay before I baked it, and then after baking, I went in and um, like hand-applied all of these. So over the years, some of them have kind of pulled out. So I've got to fix some of that. And this is like the perfect color for it. So naturally, it's going to be unusable. Yeah, no, can't use it. Sorry, Josh. So instead, I'm going to mix a couple other colors and try to get close. Again, I don't really have a good science for this. You know, I mix it together, I hold the brush up, I see if it looks right, mix again, and just rinse and repeat until I feel like it's a perfect match. And then just dry brushing over the epoxy clay. doing his big roar. He's back in action. And in case you're wondering, his teeth are just the perfect amount of creepy. They are not too creepy. All right, now this one turned out to be quite a journey. So this is the current version of Scola from our book, The Scarred King 2. But this sculpture here is essentially the prototype, you know, the version 0.1 or whatever. I made this for my mom back when she first wrote the original Scarred King trilogy. That was 12, 15 years ago or something. Um, yeah, it's taken us a while to get this out. He's had a lot of interesting design changes, such as these four feet instead of two, which, boy, I sure wish he would have had that at the beginning. It would have made um, having him upright on this, <laughs> on this uh, platform a lot easier. But anyway, so we're doing the same thing. We're um, washing him off. Now, this uh, Scola, yeah, he's not mounted on here super well. See that? You can just pull it right off meaning that he's basically balancing on these thin little, you know, pegs. Not the best way to do this. Boop. Yeah, so because I think I underbaked the clay on this, actually, I underbaked on most of these, um, and I didn't have the best idea for how to um, make things structurally sound to begin with. So, for instance, these arms could have been pegged to the body. They practically touch it or they do touch the body. So there's no reason I couldn't have done that. 
giving them a good ear cleaning here. Oh, right, as I was saying, the underbaked clay just makes all sorts of cascading problems. I will get back to that. Sometimes when refurbishing a piece, the idea of improving it just seems like a good thing to do. So here I decided to make the base way cooler. I've been learning to do XPS foam modeling and sculpting and stuff, so I thought, hey, let's make his base much fancier. So that's what I'm doing. I'm using Mod Podge mixed with black to do a base coat. And then stippling with a brush to get rid of the brush strokes. Now all the places where these wimpy little spikes fell off, I'm going to have to re-embed spikes. So I'm drilling holes in all of them so they've got good purchase. And here's a part on the back of the leg. I'm not sure how this happened, but there's a pretty big wound there. So I'm going to try to fix it, and this is where the problems start to cascade. Because the clay was so underbaked, it's really weak, and when I try to adjust it, things fall apart. Besides drilling holes for all the new spikes, I'm also going to pin the arms to the body. So I'm going to drill holes straight through the arms into the sides so that I can get them fixed really well. And <laughs> the elbow broke off from the drilling. So polymer clay, especially when it's underbaked like this, is just so fragile, so very fragile. But it does let me see that the peg that I'm going to put through here goes through really well. Back to trying to figure out how to peg these legs in well. I keep running into this problem where I sure would like a much thicker peg. So I'm going to drill a thicker hole. And this is where things start to really cascade and cause problems. Just like the elbow, but even worse, the whole leg just decided to crack apart. And I can see why. I already had a very thick bolt in there holding him up. You can see right there, I just didn't have it go all the way through the feet. And that was the big problem. So the only way to fix this is to remove the bolt and replace it. And I figure I might as well do it on both legs since I've got everything falling apart anyway. Now that those bolts are clear, oh, I can continue to mess things up. Now because this crack was so severe and there's so many gaps and stuff, I decided to just put a ton of clay in there, just refill it and live with the consequences. I'm just going to have to sculpt a lot of detail over all the cracks. Now, I'm pinning the arms in place with several different um, wires, like thinner wires instead of one big thick wire. Now I'm trying to obscure the connection point between the arm and the torso here. If I were going to start this over from scratch, I would just sculpt it so that the arms naturally press into the sides. And this wouldn't be an issue at all. So now I've got to figure out how where the holes are going to go on the base to go up through the feet. Somehow, don't ask me how, I managed to break off this little toe here. I can't imagine with all those giant drill bits flying around and the foot breaking off 30 times, how that could have happened, but it did. Okay, I'm making some mortar for to go between the bricks here by pressing sand into some freeform air. Okay. 
All right, now I'm trying to figure out how to line up the, the holes on the bottom of the feet into the new hole for that goes all the way through the shin. Now that I've got the legs more or less where I'm happy with them, <laughs> I can get back to these spines. These particular ones were made out of, um, I think the two-part mold rubber, because they were flexible, but um, yeah, they, they didn't stand the test of time. Now on this back leg, you can see the screw actually goes up and exits the skin back here. So I'm gonna have to sculpt over that. Yet more sculpting to do. And here I am trying to guess which hole to screw. A perennial problem that has plagued mankind since time immemorial. Now for these cracks, uh, this one I figured it kind of follows the line of the scales anyway, so I'm just kind of rounding off the edges and back to the epoxy sculpt. By the way, when I'm smoothing it out, I'm using this safety solvent stuff. This is the sort of thing you could learn by checking out my epoxy sculpt videos. Now, one of the things I'm doing with the new spines I'm creating is I'm not getting pedantic and hung up on making them completely accurate. I'm just letting them touch the skin all the way down instead of hanging out over. So you can see I'm like filling in underneath there because it's just one of those things they're black on black and you just don't notice and they're a thousand times stronger if they just, you know, conform to the surface. test fit to make sure that the screws will go through and this is where I did something incredibly foolish I was trying to figure out how to screw the um, the screws up through the bottom of the platform into the feet and just having all sorts of trouble getting them lined up whereas what I should have done was put the screws in the feet and just drilled larger holes in the base and put him straight through and then filled in those holes. That would have been a thousand times easier than what I did here. <laughs> Rip foot for the 800th time. Eventually I got it more or less in place, but it ended up cracking the leg yet again. Oh, this was such a painful process, you guys. Okay, some of these spines have hardened, so I'm going in and carving them in places where they weren't detailed very well. Or where they got smooshed into the table while I was sculpting before I should have been. Okay, repairing the leg again. Now to cover up all of my sins with black paint. This is the beauty of having a character that's essentially all black. You just, just paint over everything with black. It's great. I recommend making all your characters completely black. Okay, giving these little cobblestones or tiles, whatever these are, uh, a little bit of color differentiation. And there we go, new and improved uh, version 0.1 Scola will be a true collector's edition someday. Right now he lives at my mom's house, where he belongs. She's the one who came up with this character, by the way. It's one of the best characters in fiction, honestly. You should read the books, find out. You will love him, then you will hate him, then you will love him again. All right, now a quick little bonus at the end here. Uh, these little, I was gonna turn them into Christmas ornaments if I ever got a um, hollow casting system set up, but I never did, so they're just funny little heads that I got. Um, and here's a really weird thing that occurred. I'm not sure exactly how it ended up with this awful edge around here. So the faces themselves were 
sculpted in polymer clay, probably just super sculpy. And then the dotted pitted texture around the edge was done with epoxy clay, I'm pretty sure. And for whatever reason, this particular one, boy, that, that transition did not work. Okay, so first I'm gonna get this blend as smooth as I can just by scraping and carving. And then sanding. And that's usually the way you can take care of seams between uh, surfaces on your sculptures. But not in this case. You can see there's still a significant gap between the two substances. So I could use gap filler. I could use um, epoxy clay. Oh, I also have a little fracture line here I've got to deal with. Another thing I didn't know when I made these is that sanding smooth surfaces like skin um, is a great way to just make things a lot more natural and, and smooth. Okay, so this is a process where you use baking soda as a filler and then you put some super glue on top of that and it turns the baking soda into like super hard substance. And I thought that might work here because the epoxy clay itself is pretty darn strong. Ideally, whatever you're filling with has a similar hardness to the material under it. So I'm trying to get the drop of super glue to kind of fall around the right place so that it will touch all the baking soda and make it hard. I've never used it for this particular kind of application before. I've used it for rough filling in things, but not for the final like surface. So we're gonna see how it turns out. So yeah, it sets within a couple of minutes and then you can start sanding at it. And so this is both its strength and its weakness is that it is incredibly hard. However, the polymer clay that it's sitting on is softer than it, which means that when you sand over both surfaces at once, the sandpaper is going to dig away at the softer material faster than it digs at the harder material and you end up with inconsistencies. So we're gonna struggle with that for a little bit. of the glue when I sprinkle the powder on because then I'm going to end up with like pimples basically on the surface. So I did what I could to smooth out the glue before applying the powder. But the cool thing is that the glue does a really good job of seeping right into that crevice. it was such a thin coat this particular application turned out pretty well I've got a variety of different sandpapers going from you know fairly rough to super fine and uh, yeah just took a couple different coats to to bring it down so here's a great example you can see that blobby part is where the uh, super glue and baking powder turned into clots essentially and, uh, you know, I sprayed some primer over it to try to blend it together. And now I'm just sanding and sanding and sanding. And then I do another prime and then I sand. And basically it turned out to be a longer process than it needed to be. If I would have just gone with, probably I would go with um, epoxy clay or epoxy sculpt to fill the gap next time. And I think it would have gone much faster. But yeah. I got it to the point where I'm fine with it. I'm not gonna let perfect be the enemy of the good here. I'm using AK Interactive uh, wax-based metal clay to give it kind of an old bronze look. I'm trying to give it that sort of uh, beaten metal, old-fashioned uh, Christmas tree ornament look. 
you can see I've still got some issues here. There's a line that I didn't quite fix, but again, I'm like, at this point, I'm saying, okay, we're good, it's fine. It's fine, everyone. So there you have it. Through this process, I learned what not to do, a lot of things not to do. Hopefully you did too, and hopefully this will head off future problems for you and make your life easier the next time you have to move your art. That's my hope anyway. Thank you so much to my patrons who keep me going through all this. Uh, it's, it's, been a, it's been a while, it's been a tough while, a tough month. Uh, Heather was in the hospital for literally a week after having a chunk of her lung cut out on Tuesday. So it's been, it's been a cramming effort to get all of this work in here for the video this month, but I think we're just barely making it over the finish line here. And uh, hopefully, like I promised last month, hopefully next month will be the video about uh, setting up the new space and all of that fun stuff. I, I'm excited about it. There's lots of really cool stuff to dig into there. Uh, so hopefully I'll see you guys then. Thank you. Bye.